Okay, hello and welcome to our um, online lecture on the slave trade. This will be um, an assessment question, uh, one of the four essay options. So what we cover today and in subsequent um, two or three lessons are all directly linked to the essay question on um, the slave trade and slavery. <coughs> so we are primarily concerned with the role played by Britain in the slave trade because also this is a, a British history course but a little bit like the um, previous topic of the first British Empire we are talking about the Atlantic world so we're looking at these different points of the Atlantic world Europe obviously Britain is part of that the west coast of Africa and then the Caribbean and North America more so maybe the Caribbean and North America um, and what we discussed today There are three component parts to this um, topic. Today we're going to look at the um, extent of the slave trade, the origins of it, you know, why does it become this um, method of um, commerce that will transport millions upon millions of Africans from one continent to another to pick um, produce and then sent back to Europe. So we'll talk a little bit about the extent of the slave trade. We will then talk today about the Middle Passage, which is that journey itself uh, from uh, the west coast of Africa to the Caribbean or North America. And then finally, not today, in a future lesson, we will discuss the abolition of the trade. So Britain does play a really important part in starting the trade. It is there um, through most of the 18th century um, at the heart of the, the, the kind of pain and anguish and death that comes with the slave trade, very much responsible for it. But she's also there at the end to play a leading role in abolishing the slave trade. Now, whether or not that makes up for the pain and suffering caused, I am not quite sure. In fact, I would say that it does not. But the story of the abolition of the slave trade is still an important one. And those who are um, the key players and key key groups who bring about the abolition of slave trade, they were in no way whatsoever responsible for slavery and had, had spoken out against it for a long, long time. So they um, deserve the credit they get for bringing an end to this trade and putting pressure on the British government to end it. First thing I want to talk about very quickly, because we have touched on this already when we looked at the first British Empire, you should be familiar with this map of what we call the triangular trade by this point, the um, trading system that occurs in the kind of um, 17th and 18th centuries in, um, in Europe, Africa and um, the Caribbean and North America. This triangular trade um, was obviously fundamental to the origins of the, the slave trade because one of the points of the triangle is obviously the west coast of Africa. Now, in that previous um, class on the First British Empire, we did raise this question linked to the historian Simon Sharma. Why did Britain end up with this wrong empire, the empire of slavery? Why did Britain end up playing such an um, important role in the uh, transatlantic slave trade? When, as you know from the very first lesson we did on what is Britain or what was Britain in the 18th century, we focused on the ideals of liberty and freedom and tolerance. How did these fit in with slavery and death that comes with slavery and the horrendous working conditions that came with slavery? How did these British values uh, tie in? And they don't seem to fit with the British idea, idea or ideal of, of liberty. And um, yeah, they, they don't. They don't tie in. They are ignored, or they are not seen as being part of the British message of liberty and freedom because we are talking about black Africans who are deemed to be racially um, inferior. Whether or not that was a real view of, of some white Europeans or whether it was a constructed view to justify their actions is something that um, you might want to think about. doesn't really matter to some extent. What matters is that Africans were deemed to be racially inferior and therefore it was justifiable to send them to um, the New World. Um, Slavery, or the slave trade and then slavery, were to some extent regarded like any other business. So 
trade in manufacturing goods, trade in sugar, trade in tobacco, trade in slaves. They were um, slaves, they're seen as, as commodities. And therefore the slave system was run like a, an economic system more than anything else. It was an actual trade, and I'll come back to this point later on. Um, Africans themselves play a, a key part in this trade um, of, of slaves. It was, to some extent, um, the slave trade was to some extent, sadly, no different than any um, kind of global or globalised version of trade that we have today, where commodities are shipped across the world from one continent to the next. And um, yeah, there's no reason to think that slavery and the slave trade was, was not a global capitalist um, enterprise. And slaves were um, a very um, wealthy um, or a very um, important way of increasing the wealth of um, traders. Um, lots and lots of slave traders became um, you know, incredibly rich as a consequence of being involved in this, this trade. So slavery may have seemed to be a kind of outdated, pre-modern um, model of, of, of kind of, um, you know, um, treating people. And we can go back to the Greek times, we go back to ancient Roman, slaves did exist. But slavery now was much more business orientated. So the way that people were being treated was secondary to the the, the kind of financial benefits that came with the slave trade. Slaves, therefore, were a commodity, and therefore, morality was was not a concern. How slaves were treated really was not um, too concerning, other than is the slave being treated in such a way that he will return profit at the end of the transaction. And we'll speak a little bit more about that when we, we discuss what we call the middle passage. But morality was um, not a concern. You would feed your slave in the same way that you might feed your horse, or the, the same way that you know now people might use fuel to run a vehicle. Um, it was the, 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 the consequence, the function of that commodity, which was important, not the commodity um, it's, itself. And, and, and that um, leads us to a term that I think is very important to raise at this point called chattel slavery in the 18th century was chattel slavery and that means that a chattel is a, an item, a commodity, a thing and slaves were treated as things. Whereas in the past, let's say for example on the African continent, if slaves were captured during battles or wars, they were still treated like human beings, they may have been asked to do slave labour, but they were not being worked to death and, and that is a, a major um, difference. Chattel slavery basically um, is, is not a moral form of slavery because it does not consider slaves really to be human beings. Okay, before we get into the, the first stage, if you like, of the slave trade, which is the, the African um, theatre of slavery, I want to look at the extent of the slave trade. So we should start off with some quantitative data. In your study of history from first year, second year, third year, fourth year, you are going to have to um, accept the fact that part of history, it doesn't have to be a major part, but part of history does involve dealing with quantitative data, numbers, statistics, tables, graphs, etc. More often than not in history, you will enjoy the sections where you read about um, people and where individuals themselves give testimonies or write narratives and you kind of get a real sense of what life is like by reading these. We've got to look at one of these examples today of qualitative history. But the quantitative history, things that can be quantified, um, tend to be a bit more daunting or a little bit more tedious for students. So I don't want you to run away from it. I want you to accept the fact you're going to have to use numbers and statistics in assessments and essays when relevant. There's also a little online activity on using quantitative data that um, you can use um, or that you should complete actually on my site. For now we will do the most basic of tasks and, and I'll run through the answers but what you might want to do at this stage is just pause the, the presentation here, go to the Sway presentation that is on my city and click on that and take a little bit of time to look at the source which is this source here and the next slide. So if you go just to the Sway that 
is on my side it doesn't have me talking over it you can take your time um, completing this activity looking at that source and uh, you're just going to draw me a little um, bar graph basically um, or a histogram whatever you call them if you want to do or a line a line graph if you would prefer right something that basically can display the nature of the slave trade from a British perspective across the 17th and 18th um, century and into the kind of early 19th century so when you um, complete this activity you should have a um, a graph or a chart that has um, in the vertical axis the amount of slaves and I've suggested here doing them in units of 50,000 so you make sure you've got enough room on your piece of paper or you can obviously do this on a, a computer um, and then along the horizontal axis um, you've got quarter dates starting from 1651 so your date should go 1651, 1676, 1701 1726, 1751, 1776, 1801, and then you can stop it at that point. Okay, what does your graph reveal? Well, it will reveal, um, I would say, the kind of steady growth of Britain's um, involvement in the transatlantic slave trade, and then it will show a little um, kind of reduction in Britain's involvement, and then a sharp reduction. Um, once we get to the 1801 quarter century. The reason for that, something that you become much more familiar with in the coming weeks, is because in 1807 the slave trade is abolished. So that last date um, only really has six years worth of data um, because post 1807 Britain is not involved in the slave trade, hence why that final figure <coughs> is, is so low. So that's the kind of first thing that you want to kind of take from um, the graph, that's the most important thing. What um, I would say is that in 1751, that 25 year period, the slave trade is doing fantastic for, for, for Britain, for, for British merchants, right? And um, it doesn't drop too much in 1776, that next 25 year period. So this question arises when Britain is so successful in transporting slaves across the Atlantic, why? when morality didn't appear to be a major issue, when money and profit is deemed to be more important, why um, is the slave trade then abolished? Why does Britain give up this fantastic um, wealth that comes from the slave trade? So that's going to be a major question when we get to our um, future um, lecture on um, the abolition of the slave trade. So that's the first point. The second point um, I want to think about is just the numbers, right? So if we go to the table, right, question C says what percentage of the entire slave trade was British? Um, we can see here that it's 28%. The Portuguese are the most um, likely to have um, transported slaves across the Atlantic during our time period from as early as the um, 16th century right through to the um, 19th century. The Portuguese don't abolish the trade and um, carry on, well they do abolish the trade eventually, but they, they carry on going and they have a head start on Britain as well, as you can see. So that's um, that's question C, right? Britain has more than a quarter of a share of the trade, right? We are second only to Portugal, um, something worth remembering. Um, how many slaves did British ships carry in total? A remarkable number, just 3.1 million. So British slave ships took 3.1 million Africans who did not want to leave their um, homeland. Um, in the west coast of Africa or in the interior of Africa and Britain forced these slaves to the Caribbean but also on some occasions to, to, to North America. These are people I guess who you could say are involved in forced migration. Forced migration. Um, one of the things that um, I think is, is, is kind of interesting to think about is uh, in the current climate of uh, people from maybe the African continent trying to escape war and other problems, persecution, who try and make their way to Europe currently, right, which has been in the news also for the last couple of years, um, they are being denied obviously access to, to, to Europe and it's partly because of the pressure put on countries like Greece and Malta and then Italy uh, who you can't quite cope with all of these uh, migrants. Um, but it was a different story in the 18th century. We were saying, yeah, we, we want you not to come to Europe, but we want you to come to our um, our colonies in, in the Western world. And um, when we say we want you, we mean we, we're going to force you at gunpoint to come to these 
um, parts of the, the world. Um, although it's a bit more complicated than that, the trade, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and finally, um, question um, E, during which period did the British dominate the trade? Well, we can see if we can pay with Portugal, Britain kind of dominates where this little arc is here from the 17, early 1700s through to the, the end of that century. Um, so, I guess to summarise, the 18th century is when Britain really dominates the transatlantic slave trade. Um, one final point just to note, historians who have been gathering data on this topic over the last you know, 30 odd years have um, been able to establish that roughly 11 million, 11 million um, Africans were taken from their homelands and sent to um, South America, Central America, Caribbean and North America, which is a remarkable, um, a remarkable number. The reason why historians know about this um, in, in such great detail is really because um, it was a capitalist enterprise and slave ships wanted to make sure that their money was safe so they insured their ships. So we have lots of evidence in the form of insurance documents that tell us how many people were on ships. Um, and how many slaves got off the ships at the other end. Again, I'll come back to that point in a moment. So, hopefully um, that was a, an easy and fairly straightforward introduction to using quantitative data, right? So, you're going to have to get used to using tables. Now, let's focus now more so on Africa and Africans who were part of the trade. Where are, where are Africans victims of the, the transatlantic slave trade? Well, the obvious answer to that question is yes, right? 11 million of them, as we've just seen, have made their way um, by force to the New World where they do not have um, a, an easy time of it and many of them die, especially especially Portuguese um, slaves who are sent to Brazil. The mortality rates there um, were, were really, um, really bad. People died you know, after just a couple of years, sometimes even within a year of arriving because they are worked so hard on different plantations um, by the by the uh, Portuguese um, uh, colonists. So the obvious answer is yes, Africans um, were treated dreadfully and were victims, but there were Africans who benefited from the slave trade because the reason we call it the slave trade is because it was a trade and at each point of the triangular trade, Europe, Africa, the Americas, um, a trade of some sort takes place and we should always bear that in mind. The reason why we can say that there was what we might say a form of African agency, right, where Africans controlled the slave trade, the reason we can say that is because maybe um, the, the kind of view that we have is that British ships make their way to the west coast of Africa, they basically take their um, sailors off with guns and they um, basically point these guns at Africans force them onto the ships and then um, you know these kidnapped Africans make their way to the Americas. That's how to some extent the slave trade begins right there's a uh, the historian James Walvin actually tells the story of this guy here John Hawkins who was an English slave trader he captured roughly 300 um, Africans from what is now Sierra Leone um, at gunpoint right so violence was used and um, you know, he took these slaves to the Dominican Republic, or what's now the Dominican Republic, returns to England with sugar and perils, right? So that is actually much more of a, almost like a kind of pirate version of the slave trade. And this is in the 16th century, so it's when the kind of first incursions into this type of um, activity. The experiences of John Hawkins will change once we get to the 18th century. We get a much more, um, in inverted commas, rational, calculated approach to the slave trade because it's not sustainable to um, go to war with African tribes to steal their um, their their people. It's much more um, likely that if you could do some type of deal with African leaders and African governments for slaves, then you're, you're going to kind of um, not only make more money, but it's going to be um, it's going to be safer for the, the British ships or other European ships. Now the reason as to why this is possible, right, is because the slave trade, the reason why a trade, if you like, between Europeans and Africans can take place, is because a trade already existed within Africa. So there had been some precedent already set, there had already been, um, you know, examples of wars or conflict taking place within different African nations or tribes. 
and um, prisoners of war would be the, the outcome of those conflicts. So there was a slave trade to some extent within Africa, but it's the demand for Africans from Europeans that makes Africa much more unstable as a continent. Many of the wars that will eventually take place, much of the violence um, that will take place, was because um, there was this demand. So Africans um, go to war with each other, with other African nations or tribes, because they know there is um, some type of prize, and that prize at the end is trade with the British, um, which I'm going to come to um, in a second. So this um, idea of slavery already exists in Africa, and quite often some of the first um, slaves who would be sent to um, the New World would be the um, prisoners of wars of intra-African um, conflict. Um, I want to just very quickly um, look at the source that you can see in front of you. This is a, um, a source from the historian uh, David Eltis and it's really good because it gives us lots of detail on the nature of the slave trade between Europeans and Africans. And the bit I just want to highlight is the pink highlighted section. Um, I'm just going to read through this and, and point out a couple of um, um, aspects of how the slave trade worked. So, it says, um, an important primary question is often, um, you know, how vessels obtain slaves at only one point on the west um, coast of Africa. The short answer is that trading was limited to one region much more often than is commonly thought. So it wasn't as if ships came over and just, you know, um, docked wherever they could and thought, right, let's go off here and try and find um, some slaves. Right, that's, that's just not, not the case. Right? That was far too irrational and, um, and dangerous. So what you instead get is that ships are sent to the African coast and uh, merchants select cargoes for specific markets because Africans had regionally uh, dis uh, distinct preferences. This is the trading part, right? So you couldn't um, dock at what is, let's say, Calabar, right, which is modern-day Nigeria, and say, look, we've got all these um, items, manufactured goods or whatever it is from um, Europe. And the people in Calabar say, well, that's not what we what, what we want. So there had to kind of already be a, a kind of loose kind of deal of trade in, in place. You went to the regions with your ship stocked with the things that that region would actually want. And this is where we can see there is African agency because Africans aren't just taking any old uh, stuff that the British have dumped in their ships. It's, you know, they're not, they're not being grateful and saying, oh yeah, we'll take your junk and here are some slaves in, in return. Um, that's not how things worked. It was much more and that the British had to cater for African um, tastes of different kingdoms and different um, African nations. Um, I think so I say that 95% of the cowries carried to, cowries are little shells I should say, um, that were used as a currency, 95% of the cowries carried to the coast went to the Bight of Benin ports, that's what they wanted. Almost all the uh, metal shipped from Europe to Africa went to the Senegambia, so that's where Senegal and Gambia is today, or the Bight of Biafra. Um, again, Nigeria. And um, Manilas, or wristlets, would sell only in the uh, latter region. Almost all New England rum, so rub that came from, um, let's say, Massachusetts back to Britain, would then be sold to um, the Windward Islands or Sierra Leone and the Gold Coasts. So a very, you know, clear taste, you know, the people in um, Sierra Leone like their rum. Um, and uh, tobacco from Bahia. Um, went to the slave coast um, a bit further down, that's more so to do with Portugal than it is with, with Britain. So this was a, a trading system which um, was organised and planned and it wasn't just, you know, a, a, a let's um, you know, see where we dock it and, and, and see, what, see what happens. Ships would leave the European um, ports with a very clear um, destination um, and would obviously return um, or leave the, the, the west coast of Africa after getting rid of their produce with um, slaves. So I think it's important to, um, important to remember this. Um, one thing that Africans did want were, were firearms and um, on average per year 300,000 300, firearms made their way from Europe to Africa. Now this is very much a part of the slave trade. Africans wanted firearms African nations wanted firearms because it gave them the advantage over other African nations, one in protecting themselves and their peoples from being enslaved, and two, 
giving them the advantage to enslave other um, African people so they could um, then sell these to the British uh, for whatever goods um, the British were, were, were willing to trade. So you've got um, the kind of just the presence of Europeans makes conflict much more likely in Africa. Um, and that's really been the case ever since, if I'm being honest. Um, so that's, um, again, another desirable item that the Africans wanted, guns. Um, this source um, here, I just very quickly want to um, kind of labour this point. Um, it says, on the African coast, trading for slaves was highly specialised business. Particularly European captains would return to the same region many times to trade with the same merchants. And as I said earlier on, that makes it um, safer. Particular European ports would reluctantly... Um, sorry, particular European ports would trade with the same African ports for many years and reluctantly switch to um, new ports because you, know, you didn't necessarily know what you were getting. Um, it's the, we've got a specific example, so there's no way to touch on this because here's some clear evidence, right? Um, Stephen Dean's slave voyages from London, so this is a slave trader, uh, which made their way to the River Gambia. Um, they were um, very much um, organised and disciplined in their approach, right? So it says on the 9th he carried not only slaves, but also a female African-born merchant who emigrated as a free person to Charleston and with whom he was clearly on good terms. Patrick Fairweller's 15 voyages from Liverpool were all to Old Calabar and the Cameroons, and he was one of many Liverpool captains who traded for slaves only at those locations. And then you get a list of um, some other examples of where slave traders only really wanted to go to specific places down the west coast of Africa. Now, um, so this, will, this is something you'll pick up on the video clip that I'm going to get you to watch, but um, it's important to remember that eventually when the slave ships dock themselves around um, the, the west coast of Africa, which is a very long coast, right, um, slaves who live in those regions are, are going to be aware of the fact that you know, they're going to be either on the side of the tribes who are involved in the slave trade, so they themselves are not traded, or they have to be very cautious about you know being snatched or kidnapped. Um, the former slave, um, Alado Equiano, who we'll talk more about when we look at the abolition of the slave trade, um, he wrote that, um, in fact, I'll, I'll just very quickly quote him, he says, violent raids and attacks had forced local people to alter their daily lives, right? So that may be, especially those living on the coast, being rather cautious of ships arriving, but also um, groups would stick together, they would carry um, some type of arms when they were farming to protect themselves from a raid and they would place poisonous sticks around their homes as well um, to deter um, intruders. So the slave trade does affect Africa in a whole range of ways. It must have been a pretty tense place to live on the west coast of Africa but as the demand for slaves increased and increased then we see the interior of Africa also becoming a source of slaves so more and more conflicts um, start to um, occur. There was actually a, a slave trading um, army um, um, that was set up in um, the kingdom of Dahomey on the west coast of Africa, which traded with Europeans, and this army would march into the interior to um, to kind of get access to slaves. So African kingdoms do trade, and they make money from this trade, um, and I guess we should be, um, you know, of the view that, you know, just like Europe, Africa is not a homogenous place, right? All Africans are, are different. They come from different countries, different nations, have different religions, have different um, cultural traditions, speak different languages. So in the same way that Europeans would go to war with each other, as they did do so frequently during this period, British and French and Spanish and so on, Africans would go um, to war with each other as well. And um, especially if there was some type of economic benefit. Um, so we can see that you know, very much is Africans who are involved in the trade by this little image and it's um, Africans that they had enslaving. These are slaves on the way to the coast to um, be put on a, a ship. Um, so it's a, a highly um, rational model that eventually um, emerges and we can actually talk about a slave trade supply chain. So the, the, the supply chain in terms of the demand originates from the plantation owners in the Caribbean who will obviously, as we've seen, provide some type of payment to slave traders, might be in the form of sugar, 
or tobacco. These European slave traders would then supply those colonies with the slaves that they needed, but to do so, they had to engage in a trade with African slave traders. And these rulers, um, as we have just seen, uh, would, would, would only deal with whatever European would provide them with the goods and produce they wanted. And the suppliers of African rulers and traders would be other African slave traders in the interior of the continent. And um, therefore it's a pretty complicated chain that you know starts in the Caribbean, goes via Europe, and ends up right in the heart of, um, of Africa. And um, all of this so that Europeans could have slaves working on their plantations to produce commodities that would then be desirable to Europeans. Um, a remarkable, if incredibly cruel economic system. Now again at this point I'm going to um, get you to pause. Um, this video clip, I really only want you to watch from roughly 20 minutes to about 30 minutes. Um, within that time frame you should be able to answer all 10 of these questions. Um, so I don't want to show a video within a video, right? that's pretty pointless. So you can either pause and watch it here, or if you don't want really to watch a video within a video, you can come out and watch the video within this sweet presentation that is on my city. What you get in this little video clip is a summary of what we've just been speaking about. It's the first point of the slave trade. Um, so this is the African dimension that's discussed um, in this little kind of 10 minute uh, clip or so. It's quite, it's quite useful, I think it's a good little um, summary. Once you've watched this, once you've completed these questions, um, we're going to move on to the next point, if you like, of the slave trade, and that is um, what we call the Middle Passage. But before we do that, very quickly, I just want to talk about the Scottish context. Um, normally, if we um, were in college, we would do a little um, walking tour of the city, and we'd talk about Glasgow's connection to the slave trade. And there's lots of connections, right? This has been in the news recently um, because um, some people within Glasgow, activists, decided to change the street names and um, the, 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 the council are, are kind of quite reluctant to um, remove these plaques so now you've got kind of black um, figures from history whose names appear above um, the original street names um, so I think you've, you know, I think you've got George Floyd Street and you had Rosa Parks um, Street and so on um, and these were put next to um, street names that had a direct, you know, Glaswegian merchants um, and wealthy members of the kind of uh, Glasgow's kind of political class who um, had streets named after them. So whether it be Glasgow Street or Buchanan Street, um, Ingram Street, etc. Now, um, when we do these little walks, it's good, right? Because uh, you know, students can obviously um, see how Glasgow did benefit um, economically, or a certain group within Glasgow benefited economically um, from the slave trade. Um, and that is the case. But in terms of actually slave voyages going from the um, west coast of Africa to the Caribbean or to North America they were pretty limited much of how Scotland or how Glasgow makes its money from the slave trade is through just direct trade so Glasgow merchants would take certain produce on ships from um, Port Glasgow go straight to let's say Virginia take off these uh, manufactured goods and, and whatnot, not um, sell them in stores in Virginia in return we'd have tobacco put on the ships, the tobacco would make its way back to Glasgow. More often than not, um, Scotland and Glasgow missed out the other point of the triangular trade, which was um, the west coast of Africa. But there are 31 known voyages when um, Scottish ships do go and um, collect slaves. And there was a family in Glasgow called the Allison family. And these, um, these three brothers were located at the three different points of the, the slave trade. So you had one in um, Glasgow, one in um, Calabar in the west coast of Africa and then one in um, Virginia. And they basically um, coordinated with each other. So there were examples where British, uh, sorry, where Scottish ships um, did play a part. But the vast majority of the three million tended to come from uh, Liverpool, big slave um, port at Liverpool. So, um, so ships would leave Liverpool, Africa. Um, the Caribbean uh, and also Bristol and again you'll know that Bristol was in the news over the summer because of the um, protests there against the, the former slave merchant um, Edward Colston whose statue was torn down and thrown in the river. Um, okay let's um, let's move on to the Middle Passage. Now 
this um, this section here is directly linked to what you have to know for your assessment because the middle passage is so horrific, so dreadful, so horrible and um, so many aspects of it which we're going to touch on are um, inhuman that when there is the beginnings of a movement to abolish the slave trade it is the evidence that comes from the middle passage that is so vital. This evidence will partly convince the British public that the slave trade has to come to an end. So if you think about this um, this experience thus far in terms of what we've just spoke about, in Africa itself, it's a pretty traumatic experience, being captured at gunpoint, being marched for days across the land till you get to a ship, and there you're kept in coffles and yokes. So these are the items that kind of made sure that slaves could not escape because they were connected to each other. And then you're put on a, you're then put on a ship, and on that ship you are um, not sure what is basically going to happen to you. On that ship you are um, maybe even thinking that you might be um, going to be suffer from cannibalism, and that is the major, that's the major um, concern um, for some of these um, slaves. It's the unknown. And then once um, on the ship, the trauma continues, and that is what we call the that's what we call the middle passage. So um, I want to touch on, and we'll, we'll get to the trauma which comes at the end. But you kind of already know the trauma of the Americas because that is the, the story we kind of spoke about when we looked at the first British Empire. So on the ship itself, the shackles, the bloody flux, this is the illness, the inhumanity. That is the that is the. Um, part that we're going to focus on um, right now. So this little list here is, um, I guess, a nice summary, not a nice summary, a bad summary, of the Middle Passage and what went on. So disease, death, murder, suicide, humiliation, alienation, torture, separation, terror, all of these things are um, the experience um, or the experiences of, of African slaves. Now, how do historians know about the Middle Passage, right? They know about the Middle Passage because of um, sources that are available to them. Now, it must be stated that there's not that many um, slaves who were able to write about their experiences or tell people about their experiences because when they get to the Americas, when they get to the Caribbean, their lives um, are, you know, you know, lost, if you like, to history. Their story is kind of lost to history because... You know, white people in America or white people in the Caribbean are absolutely no not have no interest whatsoever in documenting the lives of slaves. Slaves have to do this themselves. Africans have to do this themselves. That's incredibly difficult. So it tends to be slaves who escape and make their way back to Europe or to Britain who can give this testimony. One such individual is Alado Equiano, who I mentioned. Another is Otto Bukaguano, who you can read about in your own time um, in Source 3. And these sources might be quite useful if you are writing an essay on the abolition of the slave trade because they provide the evidence that can then be, um, I guess, used, if you like, by the abolitionists to try and convince the British population that slavery or the slave trade is wrong. The other example of testimony we have actually comes from ship crew. Now, these are actually quite useful, even though we, we, might, we might have to kind of question ship crew's uh, testimonies because sometimes they won't want to um, state that they are part of such a, a horrific trade. They want, to, they want to kind of talk about the crimes, I guess, against humanity that occur with on these ships. But they, uh, they are useful because when they are um, honest accounts, when white wealthy men on these ships say this is what happened and they talk about the horrors then we, we can tend to believe them and one such example i'm going to point to before we finish today is from um, a ship's um, kind of doctor called alexander falconbridge he gives such a graphic account of what life was like on these ships that um, you can imagine the impact this would have on the british population when they eventually read um, his account and there's some other things as well i guess that um, would tell us about the, the ships, some newspaper accounts that might publish, you know, um, testimonies from people like Falconbridge, and then you would have some ship artifacts um, found in museums maybe um, nowadays, and um, you know these might include you know shackles and so on. These were even used um, by the abolition 
uh, abolitionist movement to again show the British population just how horrific th things were. And then finally, you had slave ship images, um, which included the famous Brooks slave ship, um, which I'll show you in a second. So this here is the autobiographical source, right? You can read in your own time for a little um, first hand African account of the slave trade. Um, it covers, covers two pages. And here is the Brooks um, slave ship um, showing slaves tightly packed in to maximise profit. Um, here's the top part of the ship, here's the hold of the ship, and you can just see the inhumanity that would come with um, such an experience. The, the stories of, of what this was actually like are well documented in the Falconbridge source that I'm about to, point, about to point you to, but also in the My City materials. There's a, a video documentary in there that you can um, you can watch. And um, yeah, here's an example of the, the the chains that slaves had to wear in the hold. So not only were slaves tightly packed, they were um, they were chained and would only be allowed out up on the deck for fresh air, um, or they may have to make their way to a, a bucket to use the toilet. So you can just imagine how horrific this um, ship journey, which could last you know as long as six weeks. Um, how horrific this thing could be and the whole time these um, Africans have no idea where they're going they don't know what their their fate is um, here is the Alexander Falconbridge source click on this and you will get uh, this source account here um, and it's, it's excellent it's horrific but it's an excellent account of the the middle passage and it's evidence I think you would definitely want to refer to if you decided to answer um, a question on this topic so that's all for this kind of first section on the origins of the trade and the Middle Passage. There will be a future um, online lecture that will cover um, the abolition of the slave trade itself and the abolitionists will borrow much of the imagery of the Middle Passage um, when we, we start to look at how the British public are eventually convinced that the slave trade has to end. Thank you very much.